<laughs> That's really becomes a liability. Uh, <laughs> about the downs. The downs don't matter. Focus on your hiking and you're moving forward and just relax in the downhills. You'll be totally fine. 11 to go. This is in the yard for one. Who cares? Who cares? There's you got two big climbs. You, you go down the field. When you hit the end of the field, you bang a left. You got a big climb and then you climb and then it, then it levels and you're going to feel like, oh, this is great. It's not because it's going to go up again. You're going to bang a right and go up again. And that one's worse.
Um, and it's just great to get 10 miles in before people have even gotten up. That, that feels good, gets you going through the day. And then I set myself little goals uh, at the beginning of a race season or beginning of a training cycle. I'm not a sponsored athlete. This is not how I support my family. So it's, um, I can only take it to a certain level, but I am trying to take it as far as I can within reason. Top five for this year is obviously finish Vermont. Finish Vermont in under 24 hours. Finish Vermont uh, smiling, hopefully. Balance is a big goal as well and that's being more efficient in my training. So being an endurance ultra type athlete, it, you know, there's a lot of hours out on, the, out on the trails, out on the roads, wherever. Getting up earlier than I normally do, get the training done, be a dad, be a husband, do my work, cook food, basically be Superman. <laughs> to strike that balance again is, is a goal, is a goal of mine, because this is, uh, it's so important to me uh, to have this in my life that I don't want it to go away because I can't do just about everything. Of course, it, it's hard every day. So. To me, when I first started running, running was a competitive sport. Running wasn't an activity. Running wasn't participation. Running was competition. It was like a baseball game. It was like a football game. When I was a kid, I grew up playing all the traditional sports. When I started running, that competitive mindset, that competitive instinct was just part of me. So that's what running was to me. You line up on the starting line, they shoot the gun, you try to beat as many other people as you can to the finish line. And when I did my first 100 mile, that's the way I tried to run the race. Well, what happened was I beat nobody to the finish line because I ended up defeating myself. Running 100 miles means you're mentally tough and you have the support that you can do it. To be honest, when I started running and, and I started getting into longer distance, the whole point of it is just getting your mental game capable and getting organized. There's a lot more preparation that goes into 100 milers than the actual 100 milers themselves. I think it was the personal challenge. It was the it was the personal struggle that I endured to get to the finish line. It's not just running. What gets you to the finish line of 100 miles is what you're willing to put yourself through to get there. I think everybody has a different, um, you know, reason that they they get into it, um, and you just or you fall in love with it, and you really can't help yourself. So you've just got to be ready to just throw time and everything out the window and just hammer at it with everything you have. And I think if you get that then you, that answers the why. Because there's no, there's no other reason to, to do this really kind of selfish act. What I like about it is it's bigger than me. You know, like every time I line up at the start line, you don't know what's gonna happen. I almost can't even describe it. It's actually like a transcendental experience. <laughs> There's nothing quite like a hundred miler. You know, so many factors come into play, and I think a lot of it is, is anticipating that you are going to hit low points and really trying to prepare in advance for how you're going to mentally overcome them. Because the fact of the matter is, you know, if you just keep moving forward and you make those necessary changes, like you can go forward and you will feel better. And it's, it's really about just having that never give up attitude and just taking it one step at a time. If you look at an elevation chart of a 100 miler, you go through the same up and downs as a human being all day long. You're constantly up and down. And when you're not taking care of yourself, you hit a low spot. And it's the same in life. When you're not taking care of yourself, you hit those low spots. When you are taking care of yourself, you hit the high spots. So a 100 mile race is, is just a big roller coaster from start to finish. Before you can really figure out who it is that you are as a person, you need to strip yourself to the bone and then rebuild. A lot of the times in races, you look to have a mantra or something that can just you know, keep you going forward and help you through a low point. And so for this, um, I really like it because sometimes you know, if I'm just out there running and I'm feeling a little discouraged, I look at my wrist and I remind myself that I have to rise above. Well, I was doing a lot of marathons and I thought, well, try something different, but I thought, a hundred miles seems a little bit insane. I, that, that, that's a little bit crazy. So I thought, well, I'll try a 50 miler. So I, I went up, did a 50 miler in Canada. And when I was done, I, heck, I thought, I felt worse than this after marathons. So I signed up for Vermont. 
five years ago, Laura Farrell founded the Vermont Adaptive Ski and Sports. Vermont Adaptive Ski and Sports is a nonprofit, volunteer based organization that provides recreational and competitive athletic opportunities to people with disabilities. And to support that sports endeavor, she started this race as a fundraiser. And uh, the first couple of years, there were only horses because uh, ultra riding was a big thing long before ultra running was. And uh, as the ultra running kick started taking off, more people started coming to the horse race, and here we are now. Sometimes hundreds, when you're forced to walk up a mountain, you get a, you get a reprieve, you get a break. Yeah, it's tough, but you get to break. At Vermont, you can kind of run a lot of it. So you do, and you can burn out, and you can get injured, and you can run too hard. It's crazy that it's this wild logistical puzzle that they put together to make work. Um, it's not flawless, but it's, it's this amazing controlled chaos. It's 10 after six, and just finished about 10 miles. And it's time to go to work, and I'll be running to work today, so i got to get some coffee. i got to recover a little bit with a banana and be on my way. And, of course, say hi to my ladies. So um, that's a typical morning when I want to get some, get some miles in, so we'll check back in there today, see how things are going. never had any coaching in running. You can't just step out the door and you're automatically a good runner. I used to just go out and my training was just go and run, meaning go out every day, maybe run six miles, maybe run 20 miles. Now, Thursday night, I do hills. Wednesday, I might do a track workout. I've tried to do it very, very specific. Um, and even for Vermont, it's even more specific in terms of the terrain. So. I've been running on the roads a lot because Vermont is 70% dirt roads, hard pack. I do a lot of road running, up hills, down hills, hard down hills, because with Vermont, usually that's what people complain of most is your, your quads get totally blown out later on in the race. So that's something you have to work on is fast, hard downhill running. If you're gonna even think about doing 100, all the work you need to do beforehand is even beyond what more people even think they can possibly do just at one shot. If you want to run 26 miles, you have to run long distances, 20 miles, 24 miles, whatever it is. How do you train for a 100 mile race? How do you know what to do? You're not going to go out and run 100 miles in practice. You're not going to go out and run 75 miles. You'll, you'll kill yourself before the race even starts. So you have to kind of do the best you can, leave a lot of it up to fate, leave a lot of it up to faith, just hope that you're going to know how to do it when the time comes. It's always been about, for me, um, setting challenges and goals for myself and trying to meet those goals. I think once he feels something is worthwhile, he doesn't give up. He does not give up. I'll be doing the running to and from work as much as I can. If I'm going to commit to something like this, then I'll find ways to to make it happen. And it may include things like, you know, doing the triples. So run to work, run at lunch, run home from work. Those really work. You know, I can get 20 miles in a day. Easy, almost. I think I've gotten to the point where I know the kind of runs and the kind of training that I need to do in order to finish 100 miles. I know my legs have got it in them if, if I do A, B, C, D, E, and F. When he first announced he's going to sign up for 100, I had a really strong emotional reaction to that, and it was not positive. <laughs> I thought it was insane. And I think I even got into an argument with him about it. I was just like, no, this is not what you're doing. It's, it's too much. Uh, you're going to hurt yourself. And 
I was worried. I think she kind of anticipated it after I'd run a 50 and probably thought that, oh God, of course he is. I don't really remember her initial re reaction, but it was probably something of, do you really have to? Maybe I just remember it differently and that's how I justify when I'm <laughs> <laughs> running them. Oh yeah, she's fully behind it. From his point of view, I think he's done everything he possibly could to, to manage all the roles that he's in. Like being, you know, an employee, a husband and a father. He's, he's given the amount of time we have in the day. He's really tried to, to balance everything. You want to accomplish something, you have a set of goals. And in order to accomplish those things, you do have to take care of what you need to do. I think that anytime you're following a passion and anytime you're pursuing something of personal importance, you get a little selfish in it, whether you're a musician or an athlete or a surgeon. And what I usually talk to athletes about is there's a difference between self-centered and selfish. Self-centered is it's all about me and everybody's going to do it for me because I am just awesome and I don't care what any of you think. Selfish is getting back to that idea of balance. Where there's a purpose there and there is a value to it. And when that value gets lost or when that value shifts and they feel like there's more being paid out than being received, that's when people move on and they find something else. And the 100 mile distance right now is his white whale. So that's the mountain that's before him right now. And once he gets over that mountain, there's hundreds of other mountains. I can totally, especially now, understand how much it takes from a person emotionally and physically and mentally to get through something like that. It's in him. I believe strongly that it's in him to finish. And I just hope that on that day, everything will work well in terms of his body. <laughs> you know, sometimes I feel like I should be in two places at once. And that's probably a selfish. I'm making this decision to run instead of being at home, and I wish I could be in two places at once, and that's a decision that I make that I have to live with, but then I do hope that when you get to the final event and everybody's together, that it makes a little bit more sense than me just on a Sunday morning being out on a run on my own. I hope it makes more sense. Hard to hold back the horses at this point. I want to, I want to go, but it's enough. It's time to race. So I'm hoping everything's okay. Doesn't feel okay, to be honest. You know, I got some aches and pains that I didn't have two weeks ago. So it's always a little bit dis disconcerting, but I'm gonna do everything in my power to finish. So it might be a really long day if things are going badly. <laughs> Is it tomorrow morning yet already? Let me get this over with. All right. Yeah, it'll be fine. Any less humidity and I'll be happy. If the humidity goes away a little bit, it'll be okay. I feel a little warm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's the same stuff I've been dealing with. Just in the, well, just the hamstring or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. It's the, uh, the taper or what? Yeah, it's the taper. It's your mind. <laughs> it's your mind. It feels fine when I'm running and I'm walking, but yeah. as soon as I stop, yeah. it's not good. Then don't stop. <laughs> My name is Hank Glass. I'm a sports chiropractor. I'm medical staff at Gifford Medical Center. It's our responsibility, understanding physiology and anatomy, to help these athletes compete and complete the course. And we check them four times along the course to make sure they stay within range. And that 6% range is important because if they lose 6% range, we know they dehydrated 
their, their heart's working too hard. They can't cool themselves. Their range is gonna go out rapidly. If they gain weight, that means that the kidneys aren't functioning and they could develop a very serious condition called rhabdomyosis and that is life-threatening. We don't want to have to run a line and transport anybody. Last year, I think we had one, the previous year, none. One person went into a coma, all kinds of problems that were life-threatening. We don't let them reach that point. If they're running beyond their heart rate levels or hydration, they'll crash. But it's, you know, it's, it's been hard just to think of it as another race and have fun, because uh, I really want to finish. You know, and I can see myself finishing, but you know, I have not done this yet. And uh, it's certainly a hurdle to overcome, and I'm gonna go out and try and try and do that, and I really hope my body holds up. It's gonna be a long day. Even though I was an athlete in, in high school, and I played rugby for a little while, <laughs> but I hated long distance running, hated it. I didn't have the patience for it, um, I think, back then. I, you know, I liked to sprint around, um, but long distance running, mm -mm, didn't want to do it. What changed? Oh, meeting Lanka. I met Zach at um, Colby-Sawyer College. Uh, he was actually walking um, across the campus and he had this huge blue cast on his leg. I think it was some kind of rugby accident. And then he showed up in my um, history class. When he first got to school, he was super skinny. And then he put on pounds in college because we all drank beer like it was our job. And then we drank beer because it was my job. And like he definitely put on a bunch of pounds and he was, he was fat, he was, he was, you know, he wasn't fat, he was roly, you know, like he was, Doughy. I was running almost every day. I didn't train for anything. I just liked to go for a run. I guess I didn't realize <laughs> that Zach wasn't a runner and I completely, you know, didn't put one and one together and I thought, well, I'm just gonna go for my usual run. And he kind of went along and I didn't think, oh my God, well, this guy doesn't run, so it's gonna be pretty tough probably. <laughs> In trying to impress her, I went out and I think it was like a six or seven mile run around where we went to school in New London, New Hampshire, and I was walking by the end of it and I was almost dead. He was your typical Belushi-style college kid. He was the hard-drinking, partying kid. So were all of us. And that's what made that first six, six mile run or whatever it was, that's what made that so significant because that came out of nowhere. Like he and Lanka said, oh yeah, we ran to the, the 89 exit and back. And in our minds, I was like, holy, like that's a long way. Little did we know. And when he came back from that six mile run, I mean, his, the, a gray shirt had just turned black and he looked, he looked bad. But he did a tremendous job, I had no idea throughout the run that he was kind of done halfway through. Um, so yeah, he was pretty tough. Signing up for a marathon, running a marathon, being in a lot of pain during running a marathon, running another one, uh, not being totally ready, but had trained a bit better and it wasn't as bad. I guess I got a little bit addicted. It was probably 2008 when I came back from Slovakia. That's when I really got into to ultra running because it was May of 2009 was when I, I ran Pineland 50K for the first time. When he did the 50K at Pineland, I remember leaving Pineland and the 50 milers were still out there. And I remember him saying, there goes the 50 milers, they're crazy, I'll never be able to do that. And I was amazed, as people run 100 miles at a time, this is in Vermont, oh my God. So I had that kind of on my radar back then, but did not think I could, um, get that far, for sure. It's grown, you know, first he, he wasn't doing it, and then he's doing it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then all of a sudden he's doing 100 miles. Now that he's a father and a runner, um, 
he is quite different and so committed to his daughter. Mm -hmm. it, it is amazing. But he's also committed to running. And he's managing to do both of those things with a full-time job, which is quite a change for him. It's a lot to juggle and do it well. <laughs> At the end of the test, we're going to use a ratings of perceived exertion. And this is a scale that you know how you feel. Towards the end of the test, we want you to feel like it's the hardest thing you've done. That doesn't mean psychologically, it's physically. OK, so the Vermont 100 is a psychological challenge. We're looking for a minimum of 18, but 19 or 20. And she'll also ask you why you stopped. OK, so you're going to, yep, yep, there's got to be a reason why. Okay. So we're going to start at 0% grade, then go to 2% grade, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Mm -hmm. I will check in with you every 30 seconds, and I'll say, are you OK to go to the next stage? Yes, no, and this is maybe. Do you want me to try and find the camera? I don't know where it'd be. It should be right here. All right, here we go. You're plenty warmed up, so I'm not even going to spend any time on that. OK, Zach. Ready? Okay, here we go. 
Come on, that's been 10 seconds, Zach. Can you do 10 more? All right, keep going. Keep going. That's 10 seconds to the 30. You want to go past 30? Okay. That's, that's been 30. Can you do 30 more? All right. That's been 10. 20 more? All right. Starting to stabilize here, Zach. 20 seconds. Got it. Five seconds. You want to stop in five? Go up? Okay. I'm actually going to lift the grade a half. You're at 14 for seven. We've got to run it out. Can you do 10 seconds? Okay. We know he has a low max heart rate. Uh, his max heart rate was 180. His age predicted max heart rate would predict around 190. And we can assume that the reason he has a low max heart rate is because he has a very strong left ventricle part of his heart. So he's pumping out more blood per beat than the average person. We also know through the max test that he actually, he plateaued and then went down a bit, which means he exceeded his max VO2. So we know that he has great uh, mental stamina to push through pain. And it looks like he's gonna burn about 16,000 calories in the 100 mile race if he uh, meets the goal of running it in 24 hours. So he's gotta eat a lot before, during, and after. Part of the training has to be eating. And I don't mean just eating when running, I mean eating constantly. You fix a huge pack of food to go to work, it becomes a full-time job and more than the full-time job of doing the training. The mental piece is there. My question is uh, mentally really tough to the point of, are you gonna listen to your body? And so when his body says, I'm hungry, does he eat or does he put it off? So the mental aspects, when I watched this max VO2 test was amazing, but there can be a problem if you're not listening to your normal body cues. So if there's any sense of feeling hungry, you eat. Nausea often means hunger in those kinds of races, and it's when you don't want to consume something. Once you take that first step and start running, then it is just another race, and you've just got to be, over the course of a long day, you've got to be smart. You've got to be strategic. You've got to be mentally tough. And you really got to stick it through the ups and the downs, because that's just like the hills here in Vermont. There's plenty of ups and downs in your head and uh, how you feel physically, so. 
going to be all about managing that. <laughs> His basic plan was to run, sort of shoot for 19 hour pace for the first uh, 31 miles or so, uh, and just keep that like comfortable. And then basically from 31 to 70 to when Kevin jumps into pace him, we'll keep him cool and make sure he just kind of chills out through the heat of the day in hopes that when he gets to 70, we'll be, at a, we'll be better able to assess where he's at. Yeah, we'll at assess 70, where and, and, and whether. If it's, yeah how much we're going to put the throttle full or how much we're just going to get him there. So I was in Slovakia for his first try at Vermont, which was a big bummer because it was unexpected. I think mentally we were both kind of prepared for me to be there. So I was able to follow uh, his progress only online. It was not exactly as I hoped. It was very dry that year. There was a lot of running with a light that it was fixated on this golden spot in front of your face. It was just, it was a beautiful experience up until about, I think, 88. When, when, when we left Bill's, he was, he was bad off and he was having a bunch of issues. There's a lot of hysteria going on at mile 88. I mean, you're, you're in it, you're there. And it's been dark for three hours, you're in tunnel vision. It's the last time that they have to hop on a scale for the day. And the doctor either says, go ahead, finish, or you've lost too much weight, or you've gained too much weight. That's the last worry. It's either that or go home. And once the runners leave 88, then it's up to them. Now it's out of our power. We think you can do this. Go for it. I remember being in LA, it was a Saturday, and I, you know, had butterflies in my stomach, was so nervous for him, and just sitting by the phone waiting for Kevin Kerner to send me updates. And, you know, being up in Vermont, you don't get good service. And I was so distracted that whole day, just wanting to know what mile he was at, how was he doing. I remember watching one video of him coming into an aid station where he had to do a weigh-in. And just watching how he was moving, it shredded my heart to pieces to watch him, you know, kind of slowly deteriorate. And by the time we got to mile 92, we had basically walked from Bill's to mile 92. And beforehand, he had told me not to let him sit down. I tried to call the cell phones, but the reception is not very good. So I remember going to sleep and just kind of 
hoping it's gonna be okay and I'm gonna wake up in the morning and I'm gonna see a post on Facebook or something that he's finished and everything's okay and he's okay. And I had a pretty interesting dream that night where he was in this big barn and he sat down and he couldn't stand up. Don't let me sit down the entire time. I said, yes, sir, you know, like, let's get you, let's get you back. At mile 92, he, he was like, I just need to sit. And as soon as he sat, I just kept feeding him soup. And I was like, come on, let's go. Like, no more. And he said, okay, if I can stand up, let's go. And he went to stand up and he got about like two inches off the chair. And then it was like, all right, do you want to be done? And he's like, I can't do this, so. And he was just like staring, and I remember that stare in the dream. He couldn't go on. I had watched like my best friend suffer for 10 miles. Suffer, you know, and it was like, okay, fine, there'll be another day. It was great that he was man enough to know, if I go any further, this is gonna be really painful. Like it's painful now, if I go any further, it's gonna be, I'm not going to be able to repair this pain, you know? Eventually, I think it was by noon, um, I found out that um, he dropped. And at that point, I was, my heart was just completely, you know, racing, because uh, I didn't know why. I felt awful that he didn't finish the last eight miles, but very relieved that he was okay. I think about it all the time. I could have finished that race. I think about lying on that, that cot in the, in the medical tent, just, I was totally spent, um, but that was, uh, you know, it was a low, low moment, but you get, you get past them. Just remember that cot <laughs> and that pain, you could have done it, so. Ironically, Vermont 100, Zach's first attempt when he had to drop, when he was so close, was, uh, that was the day I decided I want to come back and be a part of that with him. and, and be there face to face to watch him, you know, conquer and triumph and struggle too and be there to support him. Here it comes. Looking good, home slice. How you feeling? Yeah, good. Here. Good. Enough. Claws are already a little bit sore, but. What is it supposed to come off? <laughs> You're running a long way. All right. Bug spray, sunscreen, chapstick. Okay. Sarah, can you grab that towel? Good nice job, buddy. Nice work, man. Cloud cover, sweet, huh? Yeah. Okay, so you're sure you don't want that the empty hand towel? I am sure. Okay. No, I would say noticeable or annoying? Annoying. Mm -hmm. Annoying. Don't worry about the down. Don't overdo it on him. Don't overdo it on him because, you know, you got a lot of down coming up. You got a lot of up coming up, too. You don't have any flat coming up. You're doing great, man. You're doing great. Go, run with a buddy. Come on. I need company. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, brother. All right. Cool. It's pretty solid. That's really solid. I mean, I think, you know, a little quad crankiness is okay. It's not ideal, but. No, I think it's only going to get worse. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to be walking a lot of downhills. We'll remind him at, when we see him next, yeah. to take the downhill super easy. He, he's not going to want to. He was hoping that the pains that he knew was going to come were going to approach at about 50. So they're a little early for his liking. So I'm looking forward to 10 bear to see. And that's a 47. So I'm looking to see what, if he, what he feels like then. And then go from there. And then, you know, he's only halfway, he's halfway done. He just has to do that all over again. 
my job on crew, I, I love the crew. It's, it's so much more fun than running. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you have to train for it a little bit and being able to be sleep deprived. Um, but really my focus, what I try to do is ask him the questions that he's already asked himself, but maybe ignored. Uh, that's really my job is to be that like conscience almost to say, make sure you're eating, check us in, how's this? But also run a long way. You need some tough love. Like you need to push. Because you, you got to kind of give them that tough love, but you also have to know when it's time to, to stop. Crewing is really no more than just watching your runner, understanding what they need, and, and making sure they get it. it. It's, you know, you have the easy job. It's up to them to push through all the horribleness that can happen out there. Just make it as easy for them as possible. Year two was very, very exciting for me personally because I was finally able to be there. You know, the way it started was amazing. He was running at a great pace. He looked great. Looked like an animal, to be honest. Everybody that was pacing him and crewing him were just impressed. He had dropped a lot of weight from the year before. He looked like an animal. He looked like he was like, this is just another day at the office. I was ready, I'd done the training, I had built up the miles, I'd done just about everything correctly, I, I, at least I thought. We were at the Lincoln Covered Bridge and the aid station prior to that, he had come in looking good. I overheard him saying to Ryan and Kevin that his knee felt a little wonky, but that everything was well and he was feeling good and everything was, you know, on track for him to have a good day. I saw Lenka starting to get a little more and more worried. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting and after an hour, and an hour and a half, it was pretty clear something was very wrong. 45 minutes, maybe an hour past the time he was due there, he came hobbling up the highway and crossed through the Lincoln Covered Bridge and Kevin and I just kind of looked at each other and you know, your heart sinks. When he showed up, it was, it was devastating um, to go through that conversation. Is he gonna drop or not? We let Zach walk down the uh, 100 meters or so to the aid station with Lenka and just let them have their private talk. I was coming down a hill, it was about mile 28, when I kind of noticed something and it just, it burst. You know, I, I walked for 10 miles between 30 and 40 and it was just, it was agony. There's a certain type of pain that you can run through and then there's a certain type of pain that you're gonna cause yourself damage. So making that decision mentally was, it was, it was devastating. I wanted to see him cross the finish line. And it was tough to um, yeah, cheer him on. I wasn't even trying anymore because I knew it was impossible. He had to go through the loss, experience that uh, disappointment. But at the beginning, it was almost uh, insincere to try and be cheerful and say it didn't matter because it did. We were all in tears. I mean, it was heartbreaking. And for it to be something like a baker's cyst behind his knee rupture that he never even knew he had, so couldn't have done any treatment, um, you know, couldn't have predicted that that would happen. It just seemed so unfair. And it just was, it was a freak injury. Um, there's no two ways about it, but I had put in the proper training all the time and the effort. You get everybody together, they make the effort to come and support you, um, and then you have a freak injury. But even the harder part was sticking around to just help support everybody else that I knew still running after I was injured. Um, that, that was a hard thing to do, and then going to the awards the next morning, that was hard to do, with ice on my knee, no, I didn't finish. Um, so I think about that a lot. It's interesting to me how many conversations I've had with folks who didn't finish, who are laid out in the medical tent, you know, being attended to or resting. And I said, so, you know, do you think you'll come back next year? Oh, no, no, I'm never coming back. And I'll get an email from them three weeks later. You know, I've thought about it and I am going to come back. You know, I have unfinished business. I dropped out of the Boston Marathon. That was a pretty low point for me, but there really wasn't a lot of soul searching involved. I just kind of got back into it and back on the horse kind of thing. Whereas a hundred mile, it's like, geez, put a year into this thing and didn't work out, you know, am I really going to put another year into this with no real 
indication that I've got the ability to do it. The second time was dropping out, I think was worse than the first. By that point I was, my confidence was shot, everything was shot. There was a lot of negative emotions, a lot of strained feelings to the point where it was, some people who were involved in my race didn't really want to be involved in it anymore if I was going to do it again. I mean, and when I said that I'm going to give it one more shot, it was kind of like, not, wow, it was like, oh, really? <laughs> Zach. Jamie. How are you? Good, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Come on in. Good. So next on the uh, agenda is 100, right? It certainly is. We'll try it again. I'm hoping that, you know, by taking this little break, then things will settle down. I won't have any real issues and I can start 100% healthy. And, you know, one thing that I, I just don't know about is, is the potential there for us just to come back. Right? I didn't know it was there to begin with. Right. Is, is the potential still there to come back? Okay. Yep. All right. All so right. come on over. So we're going to poke around behind the knee here. You can grab any runner, find something behind the knee. I guess the key is, is it much more than the opposite side? Right. So it was a little tender there. Yeah. So we're going to check out all of the... Uh, Supporting muscles. So help me isolate where it's the most tender here. Yeah, right about there. Okay. So step on there with your right foot, take your other leg and go out to the side. Yeah, and just come back and forth a few times. Step back on with your left foot. <laughs> you have a prediction here? I do. <laughs> I do have a prediction. a lot more. Yeah. So, still got a little bit of weakness in this foot, mm. this ankle, and this glute is still a little weak, and that implies that something is working against it and preventing it from firing. Okay. Ankles and uh, hips, glutes specifically, tend to go together. Yeah. This is kind of a common theme I see. So, guys, you know, 30s and 40s who've maybe had a background of team sports, switched over to uh, endurance. It doesn't necessarily matter so much for the average person but uh, when you're training for ultras, it, ma it matters. It's not a big deal if you're a cyclist, yeah. uh, but you know, being an ultra runner, this, this little amount of weakness matters. The answer to your question is, you know, if, you, if you leave this as is, is the potential for things to recur? Yes. Uh, is a ruptured Baker cyst common? No, but uh, then again, you know, running 100 miles isn't that common either, so things, things really have to be, um, 100% in order to do that safely. So again, the theme is uh, small things tend to add up when you add a lot of dis a distance to your training. So um, there is the potential that it could could come back and bite you. There's always the risk of injury. You don't want to say, oh, it can't happen again. It can. I mean, that's just the reality. And there's a saying in bike racing that you either crashed or you're going to. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast. If you spend all your time afraid of crashing, you actually tense up little micro muscles in your face which can lend to your shoulders being tense and you're very tense on the bike, you're now more likely to crash because you'll overreact. And I think the same sort of analogy works with, with athletes. When you spend your time being so afraid of not getting injured or, or getting injured again, how much energy are you putting into taking care of the things you need to do to complete the task and to keep from getting injured? And so control the controllables. What can I do here? It's about finding that right balance between what can I do and what's it going to take and what, what are the consequences? There's definite pain in my, in my knee, in my legs. Things just don't feel too, too good or as good as I'd like them to. It's concerning to me. I want my body to hold up because I know that, again, stamina and training wise, I'm, I'm there, I'm ready. And it's just going to be a matter of structurally is my body going to hold up because you know, it just didn't, it's not, uh, it's not feeling 100% for sure.
The amount of um, perseverance and determination and patience that he has with pursuing something that he chooses to do, he's always done that, is very, very amazing to me. Because I've done, you know, I started some things myself and sometimes I didn't finish and he always does and he does it uh, religiously. I'm too practical, I'm too, too logical. I'm a math guy, always have been a math guy. I'll be running the Boston Marathon. Every mile I'm recalculating my average pace, my projected finish. I can do math in my head very easily when I'm running a marathon. That's a liability in a 100 mile race. You gotta forget about that stuff. You can't be sitting there going, well, if I hold this pace for another, I'll finish in 21 hours if I, you know. You'll finish when you finish and the time is gonna be what it says on the clock. And the going can be so slow in a 100 mile race. That's just patience. You just have to accept what it's gonna be. You can't sit there and say, I have to speed up. You can't say, how far is it to the finish? People say, all, all you need to do is worry about getting to the next stage. And that's a nice philosophy. It's good if you can do it. It's good if you can accept it, but it's not necessarily that, that easy to do. This is a really, really important aid station because this is for like, say you've just felt like death for the past 10 miles. The only thing going through your mind right now is, holy shit, I hope I pass that med. Holy shit, if I don't pass this med check, then I'm out of this race, and then I, I'm going to be pissed. Yep, there he is. I got it. You look great, man. You look Thank awesome. You. How the quad feeling? Fuck. Nice! Yes. Good job. We got check-in at the orange. We're going to go in the white tent for weigh-in. Yep. 315! You've done this section before? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So you know this is the worst por portion because of how much your body is exerted already, right? Yeah. Okay. So keep your heart rate down. The few minutes extra you take to do this, you're going to regain on the other side. But if you try to go beyond your range between now and coming back, you're going to be toast. Yeah. Especially yeah. with your quads. Yeah. Good reminder. So just be so we really, this it's from this point back. It's the most difficult. More people drop here than anything, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So be be conservative. Don't worry about your time. Oh yeah. Now, okay? Yeah, no, I'm I'm just gonna okay. play it safe on the hill. So definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you very That's much. Awesome. Yeah. That's great reinforcement. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. What's yeah. yeah. Yep. Messy. Yeah, so. Four. <laughs> <laughs> Did that? I like pull the drawing. <laughs> Badly. Man, you're doing awesome. Good, bud. Great job, buddy. She's got this. I know you're out there, breathing the same air. I'm more babies in your belly, love. I wonder what you're thinking of. Are you moving? Or are you grooving? Smiling, are the sirens ringing in the distance? Like a morning revelry, calling you to me from under my skin and my skeleton, who's carrying everything.
I wish uh, he would be able to spend more time with us, you know. I have this uh, vision in my mind that Sunday mornings would be, oh, just, you know, us eating breakfast together and just relaxing and talking about nothing and just, you know, enjoying the time. And uh, when he's going through the training, it's not always like that, you know. There's days, um, understandably so, that he's out and about, uh, he's, you know, logging in the miles. And um, I understand that, uh, I'm very supportive of that, but at the same time, sometimes I think, you know, it just would be so nice if he was here and uh, we could have that. I really, I try, I try to balance things, but I also know, maybe this is the selfish part, right? I also know if I'm running 100 miles, I, I, I have to put in a certain type of training, which does require time <laughs> and unbalance. It's not a fixed point in time. You get to balance and you don't stay there. Balance is constantly a readjustment. It's constantly fine tuning. I mean, take something as simple as walking on a balance beam and you'll see somebody constantly, all those little proprioceptive muscles. And that's the physical balance. Life balance, mental balance, same thing. You're constantly just those little teeny muscles readjusting, reconstructing, having those conversations. It's something that's really easy to forget when we get super, super busy. My wife is a very patient woman. She understands that I don't do this just because I, I do this for me. I need this. This is, we're not crazy, but it, it's, it's apparent that most of us out here are battling something. It's a, it's a disease, depression, or an addiction, or, or something. We're all battling something. So my wife understands that I need this. It, this is what makes me happy. This is what makes me feel whole. This is what completes me. So she understands it. It doesn't mean she always likes it when I'm out for the, the long night runs, or I'm off for the weekend, or gone for a whole day, and, and doing my training. But but, you know, part of being married with someone is understanding what makes them happy. I would run 10 to 12 miles, finish my run at 7.30, run upstairs, two minute shower, change, drive to work, get to work at eight o'clock, 7.58, do you know what I mean? That kind of thing, bingo, now I'm sitting there like doing my job. That, and my whole thing was next run next training run, next race. Everything I did during the day was like, okay, when's my next workout gonna be? Am I gonna be ready for it? If I eat right, did I, you know what I mean? When's my next long run gonna be? When's my next race gonna be? I mean, it, you, 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 you can, it can take over your life pretty good, I can tell you that. You know, it negatively impacted some parts of my life, work-wise, relationships. You know, the 100 mile thing is just, it's, the best, the worst, the whole thing, yeah. You're out there with other people who are struggling in their own way. I'm able to look at everything that I know is wrong with myself. It's almost like I'm looking at myself in the mirror and uh, being okay with, with, what I, with what I see. 
you know, despite all faults, you know, that I know I have. I know I have them, but I also know, hey, I'm at mile 99, and I'm going to finish. I didn't, well, I, didn't I, make, I didn't make a request for an ambulance, but somebody did. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. You really did? My understanding was you had, a, you had an individual up there with uh, urinating blood and now having uh, unable to urinate. Was that not your station? Yes, so, but let me double check. At least I didn't report it, so I'll pull back the point. Yeah, we'll go up the hill a little bit, see him coming in, and it's so kind of crazy. Like, if you, when we get up here a little bit, think of yourself having just run 70 miles and seeing like the sea of people here. It's crazy, so you can't really tell what the hell's going on. You, you sort of need a guide. So we'll just hang out here. We've probably got another five or 10, so. Great job, great job. All right, so Zach was right behind this guy. As we were pulling in in the car to uh, Margaritaville, this guy was there, and I think I was out of the car for two and a half minutes. And he was right behind this guy too, so. That's the right attitude. Good job, man. Keep smiling. <laughs> good job, man. Good job, man. Looking good. Nice job, man. Looking good. <laughs> Absolutely. That guy's gonna finish. That guy's gonna finish well. I mean, it's attitude. You know, I think the this is a stretch to chill out on. That's what I told him when we left Margarita. I was like, just chill. Just chill out. You don't have, there's nothing to prove in these next eight miles, so. Trash quads? I can't imagine why. You guys look awesome. All right, so we've got to weave. We're gonna weave through these yahoos down this way. Unclip, unclip, unclip. We got your shoes, shoes and socks ready to go. Hey, look who's all suited up. Hey. hey. Wanna go for a run? Yeah, keep chugging. No, we'll get you out of here. Drink, drink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
car again. Hey, let's walk. We will see you guys there with lights. Hammer it pretty hard between now and, and 76 if you can, yeah. because then that way you don't have to worry about it too much moving in, yeah. you know, moving the rest of the way. Yeah. This is getting done. <laughs> no shit, it's getting done. <laughs> I, got, I got beer to drink at the end. This, you better get it done. This is a team sport. This is not an individual sport at all. Like if you want to, you know, do it well, you know, I think you need you need good support around you in, in whatever ways. I mean, you know, we're driving around country roads like a bunch of idiots waiting for people to come in sweatier and more tired than they were before. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but it's also a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> Ultra marathoners are basically your average person who can push their body to extraordinary limits. Uh, I was, uh, kind of suckered into the sport myself by reading an article about a 100-mile trail run. Just looking at the pictures of the people in the race, they all looked normal to me. They, they were all smiling. And I thought, you know, if they can do it, certainly I can. But uh, I found out after dropping out at 60 miles that they had something I didn't. And it was the mental aspect, just the mental tenacity to stay with it. And I had to come back the next year to finally complete it. And it, it takes a while to develop that. Uh, it takes a while to learn what your body can do if your mind can get behind it. It's kind of a magical kind of experience. I think it's what happens to your body and your mind. When you're out doing 50 miles, sometimes it can happen, but you're not out there long enough. During 100 miles, your body physically just it breaks down. I mean, you really have to rely on your mental state to get you through. Seriously, something in 100 miles, as little as a, a one negative thought, can really ruin your day. If it's constant, you're just saying, oh, I feel awful, this is awful, I can't do this. And that keeps going through your mind mile after mile. That's, that's going to be tough to, to finish that 100 miles. The magic comes when you get to that point of physically you're done and mentally you're just, you're out somewhere, somewhere else that you've never been in your, your normal state of, of being. And that introspective look deep, deep, deep inside your soul of, I'm just gonna put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. It is absolutely amazing what the human body can do, but it's even more amazing what our mind can make us do. And I really think most people have that ability. It's mostly untapped. But I think in 100 miles, you tap into that kind of magic type thing that you have, that everybody has, I think, deep inside them. Ken Kluger, who's the race director of the Leadville 100 in Colorado, he says, running 100 miles is a game of inches, and the hardest three inches are the three between your ears. I mean, the mind is, it's a pretty powerful thing. I mean, it's, it, and it's something that, you know, it's a powerful wep weapon that you can use to your advantage. That's, that's the way I try to see it. I mean, it's amazing how just little things you do can just totally change you know how things are going for you during a long run if I hit a low point one of the big strategies I use to overcome it is I take things way back and I try to think about things you know at the fundamentals why am I doing this why am I here you know like I run because I love it and it's not just about running it's about it's about finding that thing whether it be an activity you know that you're so passionate about that it inspires you to be the best that you can be you know I mean that's really what it's about having that passion having that drive you know around a, a certain activity it's really it's it's made me a better person 
our body lies to us about what we can do. Fatigue, sleep depth, hydration issues, nutrition issues, cognitive impairment, and now you're trying to interpret signals that you really don't push to in training. It's very easy to say, I'm done, I think I'm broken. And there's another level, you just didn't know it. The risk is, sometimes you have to push to that level to find out what it is. You're so singularly focused on getting to the end and getting forward. It's just like the world, like everything kind of disappears and that's all you're focusing on, you know, and, and trying your best to, you know, kind of manage on the fly. You know, wondering like, oh, this hurts, this hurts, this doesn't feel so good, you know, but putting all that puzzle together. There's so many <laughs> little things you got to worry about along the way. That, uh, and I think what they're feeling right now is just keep moving forward. At least I hope so. I hope that's all they're thinking about. So I'm from Manuscutney Hospital. I'm one of the physicians there, and we are helping with the medical support for the Vermont 100. The first year I did it was actually last year, and I was in this barn, which was pretty terrific. I did the 8 to midnight shift. So we saw a lot of things coming in. And we really looked to see, um, do they look de dehydrated? Are they mentating properly? Are they confused? Do they look dizzy or woozy? Are they saying they're nauseated? So we really asked them a lot of questions. And they seem kind of funny, like asking somebody, how do you feel after running 89 miles seems absurd. But you know, when you ask them questions, oh, where are you from? How are you feeling? Have you been drinking? Have you urinated? You know, sometimes people will just look at you with a blank stare, you know, okay, so you need to stay a little while. If they don't look healthy enough, they're probably not going to be able to get away from us. So we have the ability to say, you're out, you just can't go further. Most people, when they're done, they're done. And they'll tell you, I don't think I can go further. We are at Bill's, which is mile 88, 89, somewhere in that zone. Did you guys see Zach? Yeah, we saw him at 76. It was great. He looked like he'd run 77 miles. But don't worry. Don't worry. That's Kevin's. How are we doing? Good. Good. The, the downs don't matter. The downs don't matter. That's what you gotta do. Just keep hiking. There's got two big climbs. You, you go down the field. When you hit the end of the field, you bang a left. You got a big climb, and then you climb, and then it, then it levels, and you're gonna feel like, oh, this is great. It's not, because it's gonna go up again. You're gonna bang a right and go up again, and that and one's then, worse. And then it goes down, drops down. And then it goes and down, and, and, then you're, and then you're Keatings. And then from there, you wave the finger, and then you crank. Yeah. Keep, keep focus on the hiking. Do what you're doing well, focus on that, because you can't change, you can't change what's going on in the downs. Don't worry about them, just focus on your hiking. How are those ups? These, these two ups that you're gonna get, it's the crux of the whole thing. You're gonna be cranking after that, all right? See you at Polly's. Rock it, Zach, you got this. Polly's is 95.5. Polly's is, we're out of here. The hills after this aid station are brutal. They're so brutal. There is some fairly, like, relatively technical stuff out of here. And you come out of this field after maybe about a mile, mile and a half running out of here, and it is gorgeous. It's gonna be awesome tonight, too. Those guys are gonna have a killer view. But then, unfortunately, you get to the bottom of that field, and then you have this giant hill that goes on for about a month and a half. And then you take a right-hand turn and go up another huge hill. Um, and then you drop back down to like 90, to the 93 mile aid station. Yeah, it's like a month and a half long. It's so long, it's measured in calendar. <laughs> if I don't finish this year, I will probably sign up again and do it again. <laughs> do it again. I will. I think that's just the, 
Maybe that's just the kind of person I am, I guess. If for one reason or another I don't make it, I'm gonna have to try again because it's uh, it's not an insurmountable goal to me if my body is is uh, okay, but it is um, it's a, a challenge I want to not only overcome, but I just I love doing it. I was running up the road the first time I ran this. It was a day kind of like today, and I was hallucinating, delusional, in the middle of the run, and thought I saw an old woman sitting on the side of the road holding a big stick, waving all the runners on, wearing this beautiful straw sun hat. It was just one of those yellow pie plates on a tree. You know, cognitive functioning is basically just how we're thinking, how our brain is processing things, all the little neurons talking to each other. And sleep is a biological imperative. All animals have to sleep. They've actually shown that if they sleep deprived, poor little mice in the, in the lab, and give them everything else they need, they'll die. We know that when people are sleep deprived, they don't function as well. So sleep is imperative. And what we know is the cumulative effect of sleep deprivation can be a really big problem for a lot of people. It has health implications, everything from obesity to potentially diabetes and all of these different things. Now we take an ultra racer and now they're going to intentionally get into sleep deprivation to try to go as fast as they can, as far as they can. And now you add in the combined factors of physical fatigue. You add in the fact that they're going to be dehydrated and they're going to have some problems with keeping up with nutrition. Now you put all that into a pot and stew it up. It is a physiological impact on your cognitive ability to process information and to think. And that's also where a lot of the athletes will get into some hallucination issues. Trees, like the birch trees that are around, often become houses without doors, or trees become people without faces. And there's some things to suggest that your brain is struggling to process. It's facing all these things that you've done to muck up the works and slow it down, and so it's trying to find something familiar in what it's seeing and, and giving it a place. The nighttime part of it is a big deal. It's just different if you haven't done a race that goes through the night. And that was part of my problem. I go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. If you do that 365 days a year, why would you think on the next day you're gonna be able to go all night? I mean, really, so that's the challenge of a 100 mile race. You're doing something that you just don't do in regular life. You're doing something that you probably don't do or haven't done in your running life. The voices start when it's, it gets dark, definitely when you're in pain. You know, some doubt creeps in your head. I think some of the thoughts definitely center around some of, some of my weaknesses, or at least my own self-perception of, of weakness. What kind of a quest am I on? What childhood thing did I miss that I need to do this for myself to build confidence? Maybe I could just stop and it'd be fine. It's just pretty muddy, it's just pretty hard. I'm pretty sore. I don't really need to do this, and no. You're gonna do it, it's gonna be over. It's like, you know, you got three hours more. Just do it. Pain is temporary, but getting through this and rising above and completing it is forever. After a 100 miler, you're on uh, cloud nine. It's euphoria, the runner's high. It could last anywhere from two weeks to two months. But it's when that runner's high, you come off of that and you crash, that you start searching for the next race because you're hooked. You need it, it's an addiction. We are out here getting the same exact drugs naturally in our body that most people smoke methamphetamines or do LSD for. We get that naturally out on the course and it's overproduced in our brains. So after you run this and that finally all wears off, you've gotta go find some more. Where are we? Where are we? We are at uh, Polly's, this is like 95, 95 and a half. Um, so it's the last time we see them before the finish. So they'll come in here. Both are gonna drop uh, the vest with the bladders that they have, just go handheld and just crank it out to the finish. So coming into Bills, he was definitely hurting. I mean, you could tell that, I mean, based on the amount of that Sarah and I did on his legs to, to get him moving, I mean, it was, you know, he's ran, you know, 88, 89 miles at that point. So he should be feeling pretty bad. How you doing, how you doing? You got to take this off. Get through it. What's up, brother? Right. One step at a time. You got it, buddy. You can walk backwards on your hands and get a nice shiny buckle tomorrow. <laughs>
All right. Zach, take your time. <laughs> Just get through it. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> You're doing take great. Your time, get through it. You're doing great. All right. You got this, Zach. You, you wanna... can go at this pace the rest of the time. You're fine. You're totally good. You're gonna, Great. you're gonna start feeling better over there. Yeah. Because you're gonna yeah. turn. It's gonna spin around. We need water. What do you want? Three, one, five. I don't know. Do you want to sit down? Do you want to sit? Don't sit. Don't sit. Don't All right. Then let's keep you up. Can you right. keep him warm? Give me a, give me a nice shirt. Just hike it in, you know. Yeah, you'll start feeling better in a little bit. Just take it in, take it nice and easy. Enjoy it. It's supposed to be fun, remember that part? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was so fun. Can I uh, just dump my shoe in here? Yeah, we have. Okay. Yeah. 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 You got the good, like, cranky bumbles. God, that stuff smells. I have other socks here. Mm -hmm. There you go. This is all you need to keep doing is there you one go. There foot you go. in front of the other. It's your only job. Just put one foot in front of the other. Good lord. <laughs> Just keep drinking that. This one's going with you. Okay. It's full of gin. <laughs> it's something stronger than gin. Sweet gin. Okay. 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 Good. Tell him some stories. Your life sucks right now, but you're in a good mood about it, right? Kind of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Four and a half. Four and a half. You got four, this, four little, little mix of road. You got some good runnable out of here. Do not miss this first left-hand turn down here. It's a little tricky. A um, little bit of road out of here, um, but pretty runnable. Um, basically to the single track at two miles to go. Then you're gonna climb on some single track. You're gonna have one, when you get on some dirt road, you're gonna have one more steep up for the finish with like a mile to go. You're gonna say you, dirt, regular dirt road. You're gonna say many, many bad words. Just power up that hill, yeah. and before you know it, you're gonna see the welcome 100 mile or congratulations sign. It's right at the top of the hill. Basically, yeah. You got, a, you got a little more single track to the finish. So after that steep climb, you got a little more single track to the finish, so. All right, let's hope that doesn't take any three hours. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would've gotten here faster than three hours. You got this, stretch. <laughs> okay. You got this. Warm clothes, cold beer. Warm clothes, cold beer. Warm clothes, cold beer. Yeah, a lot of times. Take it in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we love you. We'll see you there. You're rocking. Yeah. Good job, man. Good job, you guys. Hey, good job, guys. That's the hardest part. <laughs> He's fine. He's fine. He's totally I fine. You've been up too long. <laughs> God, he smells terrible. <laughs>
finally had to go back to the hotel. I got up and tried, you know, I, I, my legs were like jelly. I went to stand up and I was like, you know, I had to help to get to the car, that kind of thing, you know what I mean? I'm gonna do another 22 miles? I don't think so, you know what I mean? I can do another one mile. Sometimes you're that far gone physically. He's a very apologetic guy, you know, but he's, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry for walking, I'm really sorry for walking. It's like, we can walk to the finish from here and still be under 24 hours, and still be under 22 hours at this point. And then we hit mile 99, and it was like, he smelled the finish. You could visibly see him go, huh, we're there. It was like uphill, downhill, in through the woods, and all of a sudden you can hear the finish line. You can see the finish line, and then all of a sudden you turn away from it. He kept thanking me and I kept thanking him, thinking, we only have a mile left. This should take us like nine minutes. We're, we're good, you know, we're getting, going at a good pace. And he kept thanking me and I'm like, you know, we're having our bro moments. And <laughs> it just kept going and going and going. And then finally, like, by the time we got to the finish line, I was just like, Go, you know, like, get out of here, do it. Even through the tough times, whenever they come during the day, and the emotions can be raw because you're just tired. You just need to really remember that you're there for each other and you respect the other person. And it's a really big component of the love that you share. For me, the film is in a lot of ways for her because it gives her um, uh, You know, <laughs> a glimpse into her father that maybe she wouldn't get, so. Yeah, that's special for me.
Only yesterday, but I wouldn't. 